Uh, so, so far we've gone through the, the um, just the initial module of getting started with, uh, started with Shiny and, you know, figuring out the basic UI and reactivity and uh, engaging with our first app as well. Um, here, like once you've got that down, making your workflow better will lead to more uh, pro productivity so you can get to um, you can get to actually the good stuff. So uh, Hadley Wickham says, uh, I think of workflow as one of my secret powers. One of the reasons that I've been able to accomplish so much is that I devote time to analyzing and improving my workflow. I highly encourage you to do the same. And so workflow just makes uh, the process of writing shiny apps um, much more enjoyable. Um, and it just helps you improve a lot more quickly. Um, but also just it increases your uh, productivity. It, it helps you iterate faster. Um, so making, yeah, making a better workflow for yourself is definitely going to lead to some positive benefits. Uh, so what are our learning objectives for today? Um, so if you read this chapter, uh, it's broken down into three different parts. Uh, first, we're going to look at the development cycle, what it looks like to get a Shiny app up and running from scratch. Uh, your Shiny app won't always run the way you think it should. So we're going to look at some debugging strategies, uh, how to fix it. And then sometimes when that doesn't work, you're going to want to look for help. Um, so there's some helpful advice on how to create uh, reprexes or reproducible examples. Um, so that way you can share it in a space like R4DS and um, someone on the other side can easily run your code as well to help you out. Uh, so, so why, why is this important? Um, it, so it allows you to save time uh, by um, <clears throat> reducing the time to make a change and seeing your outcome. Um, and so the faster you do this, um, you, you'll become a better developer by um, being able to iterate faster. And so, so, for, so for the first part, we're gonna look at how to save time for creating apps. And then that's just a small portion of like the shiny development process. Uh, the main bulk of time savings will be in uh, making changes to your app. Um, yeah, so maybe, unless I'm mistaken, and maybe your role is to create multiple Shiny apps daily, this advice is helpful, but might not be as helpful as um, the next section. So each Shiny app has the same six lines of code. Uh, we bring in our library, we have a UI page, a server page, and then the Shiny app function. So there's two ways to build this from scratch. Uh, one, you can type uh, Shiny app if you already have an app.r file already created. Um, and then there's a shortcut for that as well, shift plus tab. Um, or uh, if you go into our studio, I can 
share that here. Create a new directory, and then you can create a Shiny application. So that's the, that's the one I'm like more familiar with. Maybe that's the case for you as well. Um, but yeah, if you're working in our studio, uh, that's a helpful way to build your Shiny web application. Okay, so as Hadley notes, and I think this is a good um, good perspective, is that you're only going to create a few day, a few apps a day at most. Um, I know for me, it's mostly just iterating and debugging the apps I currently have, and not creating ones from scratch. Uh, so. For the most part, you'll run apps hundreds of times. So um, mastering this portion of the development workflow is especially important. Um, so Hadley's advice, uh, avoid clicking the run app button. Uh, instead, much faster is to use a shortcut command or command or control plus shift and enter. Um, yeah, so that, that will have you avoid, um, going and clicking the button every time. Uh, there's, there's another way where you can have the app run every time you save. Um, let's see, it's described here. Shiny apps and background jobs. So I've never, I've never personally done this, um, but it's it will it will be even faster where you just do like Command S to save it, and then it will um, automatically run. Uh, but the disadvantages to this is it's harder to debug um, because the apps running in a separate process. Um, and then, uh, there's an, a disadvantage too, if you have a bigger app, um, I think I wasn't sure I need to go to the book for this. Um, one moment, please. Okay, so I think it talks about the benefits of um, including uh, automated tests as well. So I'm not sure if you, you're you not um, able to do that with this setting. Um, but yeah, I, I personally don't do that, but... Um, the launching the app with uh, this shortcut is will save you just as much time. Maybe, maybe not as fast, but it will it will get you there. Um, okay. And then the last portion of this section, um, there's a couple of different ways that you can uh, you can show your shiny app when you're when you're running it locally. Uh, one, you can use the viewer pane. Um, so I'll just open in uh, your R Studio session, and it'll be in your viewer, and you can look at it directly in R Studio. Um, this is fine if you have smaller apps and uh, you don't need that big of a screen, I guess. Um, 
but otherwise uh otherwise running it externally that I think I I run my apps externally maybe because they're bigger but um yeah it's definitely useful for larger apps and there's not I, I guess not much slowdown when running it externally versus on the viewer pane. Um, but I guess know that both are an option if if you want. Um, so yeah, that's that's in the drop down menu of run app and you can select uh, which one which one you want. Um, are there any any questions on the the first part of of our uh, chapter, the development cycle? Okay, it looks like we have a all good. Um, I do want to share. So, so there are a few shortcuts shared in. Um, in this first section. Um, I do wanna share this link with, with everyone. Oh, I think Lydia might be here. So welcome Lydia. Uh, but this link is uh, a link to all the RStudio um, shortcuts that you can, um, develop and make your workflow faster. So for example, you might be familiar with some of the more uh, commonly used ones or, or some of the more popular ones like uh, saving your file or whatever, um, inserting a pipe operator, uh, control or command plus shift plus M. Uh, if you're typing that out a lot, that's helpful. Um, so definitely look, definitely look over this uh, link to to see what uh, shortcuts might be helpful to you. Um, even just having like a few common things that you do a lot will help. Uh, with your workflow and make it faster. Um, let's see. Oh, these are particularly helpful for me. Uh, uh, either like find or find and replace. Those are uh, definitely helpful and useful. Um, and there's a difference between find, um, like control F versus find and files. So I'll show you. I have a question. Sure. So that would be like, um, say you changed a variable name and then you need to go change it all throughout like your script. That would be what that is? Yeah. Um, and I know there's a shortcut to um, say if you had like, say if you had that variable name, like multiple places, um, there's also a shortcut for like highlighting each one of those instances. Um, and I'm totally blanking on what that is right now, but I feel like that's in here somewhere. Um, but yeah, there's, let's see, what would that look like? Yeah, so you can do find uh, some word or regular expression and then replace it. And there's also, yeah, there's also a way you can highlight um like the same variable and then like change it in line as well 
Uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of that one right now. But the other one as well that I use a lot is find in files. Um, so say if you're working, um, say if you're working in a shiny app, you have multiple, um, multiple different files you're working with, multiple different R files, and you want to find uh, a particular word. Um, then you would type it in here. Um, Sorry. Okay. Uh, Trevin, uh, when you're done, I just wanted to drop a link. I, while you were talking, I kind of like searched because you were trying to find out the answer. So I searched online. So I got this link and um, kind of like it's on um, when you don't want to use find and replace to locate maybe um, when you want to change a variable name based on the question Lydia asked. So um, there's this um, shop called you could also use. I don't know if you mentioned it, but I'll just drop the link so you could just go ahead. Oh, do you, did you put it in the chat? I'll put it now. Yeah, because I asked because like when I was doing a Shiny app for school, um, like we kind of, I forked someone's repo and was kind of like replacing what they did with my own data. And yeah. so, yeah, so like renaming, like putting in the data name. And then once I have like, uh, once I call the data something else, replacing it <laughs> all throughout like their file, you know? Okay, I think I get, I get what you did there. To make to make the work easier, you don't have to like just write everything. But sometimes when you get errors, then you know have, you have to like check on Stack Overflow, maybe what could be the problem. So I just checked and I saw that. So I dropped the uh, I dropped the link to the website there, uh, so we could always check. And um, Trevin could just continue. I think it's just a short uh, function where you want to change and and just continue, Trevin. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> no, that's helpful too. Um, yeah. Thank. Thank you for that link. <clears throat> um, but uh, I guess the result for this is that you can see like <clears throat> every instance of what you're searching for throughout that project. Um, so here, like, this shows up in multiple of my R files. And then if I'm looking for a certain variable or, or whatever, um, that's been helpful for me. Um, I think another, so another, I just want to highlight two more, sorry. <laughs> uh, the ones, the two more that I want to highlight is say if you have uh, a function that you're looking at and you're like not sure what it does or um, you actually want to look into um, into the components of it or what makes it uh, you can do f2 and it will take you to um, it will take you to that actual function so this is the uh, function load all, and it shows uh, the actual function to it, the actual code. Um, so that was F2. If you want, if you do F1, that will take you to its help page. Um, so if you're, that's just a useful shortcut to um, get to the help page versus like doing question mark function uh function <clears throat> so yeah definitely um you know definitely check this link out uh check out the r studio keyboard shortcut link as well um but those will definitely help with your workflow and especially if you're um <clears throat> doing things multiple times like manually or or like replacing variables uh <clears throat> there's probably something that can make life easier for you <clears throat> okay so yeah we did controlling the view um 
so debugging is is definitely you'll be spending a lot of time debugging uh even when you don't think you will like hadley wrote this eight line shiny app and he was like what can possibly go wrong well apparently multiple things <clears throat> because he used this as an example in the chapter uh, so if you haven't gone through it, I highly recommend um, like walking through the debugging process um, with Hadley as you read along, because it's uh, definitely helpful, um, <clears throat> and will it will just um, help with your debugging skills to see like another perspective. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like this is definitely an axiom of programming, but something will definitely go wrong. Um, and it just takes years of experience, uh, to write code that works the first time. Um, so we, the better our workflow is for fixing these errors and mistakes, um, the the better developer we will be. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so we'll focus on three debugging challenges to shiny apps, especially. So yeah, it's definitely a bit different than script-based work, but a lot of similarities. <clears throat> So yeah, so three uh, debugging challenges we'll look at. Um, you get an unexpected error. Uh, that's the simplest uh, simplest one to fix. Uh, you don't get any errors. This one can be uh, this one can be confusing. Um, and then everything's correct, but no update and. Uh, yeah, this one's definitely the hardest. So the easiest case, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll take a look at all these. Um, <clears throat> so a solution, a traceback is returned. Uh, so we can actually find where the error occurred. Um, and the interactive debugger is very helpful for this. Uh, you don't get any errors. You can also use the interactive debugger. And then the most challenging one, uh, it's unique to Shiny. Uh, Script-based programming doesn't have this issue. Um, so you can't take advantage of your already existing R debugging skills. <clears throat> okay, so what does uh, what does fixing errors look like with tracebacks? Um, <clears throat> every R error is accompanied by a traceback or call stack, which uh, literally traces back into your R code and where <clears throat> the like last output will be the error. Um, and it's a bit weird because uh, the functions are print printed in reverse order. So um, it, it might <clears throat> it might look weird at first or if, or if you're not used to it. Um, and then the traceback tool pinpoints the location of an error. So here we have an example where we have uh, multiple functions referring to one another, um, F referring to G, G referring to H, and then H uh, being two times two. <clears throat> so if we run F, um, it works if, 
<clears throat> if we give it a value of three, if we give it a value of A, it will generate an error. Uh, so here's the error output. <clears throat> non-numeric argument to binary operator. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can't have A, A times two. <clears throat> so the traceback will show you <clears throat> each step of, of the functions. Um, so it, it walks you through like, the reverse order of what it was actually running. <clears throat> so that's that shows you, or this down here shows the actual order of the sequence that the calls took place. <clears throat> so yeah, then then we can see that. The error occurs with h of x, um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's anything else after that. Okay, so yeah, that will that will show you the order of how it was run. Uh, so you can't use traceback in Shiny because uh, you can't run code while an app is running. Uh, so Shiny automatically prints the traceback for you. So if we take those same functions and put it into a Shiny app, um, here we have just a um, a short Shiny app built with those functions. Uh, if we run that, it will automatically output the traceback. Um, so the first part of it is just <clears throat> building the app um, from scratch. Uh, <clears throat> then it goes through some functions of uh, drawing the plots and then followed by the actual functions that it runs here. Uh, and it will, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll give you the file name and the uh, line number as well. So that that's very useful to you. It's, it's very helpful when trying to debug, to debug, excuse me. So when we flip it, we can actually see the actual order that the app was run in. Um, I'll pause for any questions or comments. Um, I'm not sure if I feel like I should make a um I feel like I should make a um an edit to the repo because I'm not sure if these links were included. Uh, but in the advanced R book, uh, there is a chapter on debugging. Uh, so it goes through a lot of the um, same things and it, and it goes even deeper than uh what this chapter provided uh but yeah it will introduce you to the traceback and then uh it'll it'll go even deeper um into the debugging process for r but this one is specific to non-shiny r programming so um do be aware of that uh going into reading this chapter. But yeah, that's helpful. Uh, and now you have the link 
if you want to use it. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, currently, I was going through advanced art too, but I think the group I was with, uh, I'm still with them. But I think we're on chapter five or six. So uh, thanks. At least I know what to look forward to getting chapter 22. So I, I have an idea, okay, that uh, there's a chapter related to um, debugging, which I would um, take to heart to be able to understand more about um, the process of debugging in R. So thank you for that. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> I, I will add that um, <clears throat> I think advanced R, you mostly want to read it in order, but I think the debugging chapter is you can definitely read that without the context of everything else. So if you do want to just read that chapter, I think that you're more than able to if you don't want to read the rest of that book. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm oh. glad that you're looking forward to it. Thanks. I think I'll just do it. So check it out too. Okay. And I, I think that's, or this chapter, uh, the introduction said that like the order for the rest of this book doesn't, matter as much i know we'll be reading this in order but if there's something that you know you want to check out without reading the other chapters you want to go to the end of the book uh that's something that you can do as well okay um okay so it looks like we're doing pretty well on time we should i'm guessing we should be able to get through the rest of this um Oops, let me go back here. Okay, so so some specifics to uh, debugging in Shiny. Uh, this is where this this wouldn't be in the advanced R book. So uh, definitely good that we're going over it here. Uh, so first, few calls start the app, ignore anything before the first run app. Uh, this is just the setup to uh, get the app running. So when we outputted this, um, that's just the portion of uh, the code that's starting the app up. Uh, second, some internal shiny code in charge of calling the reactive expression. Uh, in this case, output plot is output plot is where the problem is. Um, so yes, this is internal shiny code. Uh, but the I guess the meat of the shiny traceback error is uh, the end of the traceback where it, it will show you each um, function run, uh, render plot f and g, and the helpful um, file name and line number. Uh, so that's that's kind of how you read uh, read the traceback from from top to bottom or from the start of the run to to the end uh, because it's flipped. <laughs> that can get confusing. Okay, so a helpful strategy for uh, debugging shiny apps is using an interactive debugger. Uh, this is definitely something that I take advantage of. Um, so when do we use it? So when you've identified the error uh, using the traceback provided, uh, you want to figure out what's causing it. Um, we'll use the interactive debugger. And there's two ways to do this. I mostly use just one of the methods, but 
there's there's two options and and you you're definitely free to use either option um but here uh one way to launch the interactive debugger is to uh, make a call to browser in your source code uh so if you've identified if you've identified the uh like location of the error or you, you identified where you think it is in the traceback, you can insert this browser function into that place. And when you, um, when you run your code, it will, it will stop there. Uh, so this can also be done using a conditional statement uh, so you can put it multiple places as well. There is another method, um, and that's that's by making a breakpoint in our studio itself. Uh, so if you click to the left of a line number, it will put like a red dot, uh, and that's <clears throat> indicative of a breakpoint. Um, one advantage of this is that like you're not actually editing your code. So if you accidentally like left it in there and um, like uploaded it to production or 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 saved it or or whatever, um, that would be that would be a mistake you could avoid with just using the built-in breakpoints. Uh, but I haven't had personally had much success using that. But maybe your uh, own ex maybe your own experience will be uh, different. So those are those are kind of two ways to um, to do that. And then whether you use browser or breakpoint. Uh, it will launch an uh, it will launch an interactive debugger. Um, it will it will launch in a new window, and it will be like a pause in your function. Uh, at that moment, any any like data will be like in your environment or any variables uh, will be available to you to like um, interact with. Um, so at this point you can, uh, you can do a few things. You can um, like run the next line. Uh, you can stop or leave the debugger altogether. Um, See, does this go into and and also our studio has its own um <clears throat> like interactive version of this so you can like uh run the next line and you can step into a function and then like go like a layer further um uh, C for continue. Uh, so, so yeah, using the shortcuts will definitely help with your workflow and making it faster. But if you're if you're getting started, using the debugging to toolbars uh, that's helpful as well. I think this. <clears throat> so yeah, this knowing how to use the interactive debugger and and or eventually getting to using the shortcuts is definitely going to help your uh, shining development um, improve a lot. Uh, so the hardest uh, problem 
is debugging reactivity. Uh, this is specific to Shiny itself. Um, so we need other tools which are not introduced in this chapter. Um, and one helpful way, this is common in across uh, other programming languages is using the print method, which is basically displaying and printing values um, along the steps of your app. So you, so you can see the output and you can tell whether or not you expect that or not. Um, specifically for R, uh, Hadley suggests using message instead of just printing. Um, but it's the same, uh, it's the same concept. <clears throat> um, any questions before we go on the last part? Uh, reproducible examples? Uh, no question for my end. Let's just see the examples. For my end, no question. Okay. Um, before, I, I just want to share one more link too. Um, yeah, before we get into that, I this little um, uh, pocket guide on debugging just came out from a person named Julia Evans. Uh, so it's it's a helpful little guide, and it this is a general. It's not specific to R, but it's a general uh, guide and toolkit for helping you become a better debugger. Uh, so here's like the table of contents um, going over like what's included in this little book. Um, but I thought I might share this in case anyone's interested. Um, Julia creates some other like cool programming magazines uh, to like help you out with programming concepts as well. So I saw that this had just come out and it looked really interesting as well. Um, and I think, I think she may have like discount codes available as well. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to, uh, if you just want another resource for, uh, learning how to be a better debugger. I think this one looks uh, looks really interesting. Um, so I guess, I guess when you've like exhausted your, um, may maybe you've like hit your limit on, on finding the reason for your error, uh, you might want to look for help outside of, uh, you, you might want to look for help outside. That might be, um, that might be the shiny community. That might be, uh, like the posit message board or the Slack channel, the R4DS Slack channel, uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, there's several avenues where you can go to find help, uh, but a helpful skill for helping yourself is be, being able to make useful reprexes or reproducible examples. Uh, so the idea is that you can share a, a reproducible uh, example and someone else um, outside of your computer can also run that same code and get the same like expected outputs. Uh, so you make it easier for the other person. Um, 
And a way to do that is to make it uh, minimal as well. So you don't want to send someone your whole like shiny file and your shiny project. You want to narrow it down as much as you can to uh, make it as small as possible, but still create that same bug that you're trying to fix. Uh, so being able to do that is like a skill and uh, like you're helping other people help yourself that and the better you can make a reprex is you'll you'll be able to get help like more quickly and and people will like thank you for that too um so how do you make that uh create a single self-contained file that contains everything needed to run in your code uh you want to include like all the packages that you use so that people know what needs to be on their machine. Uh, you can test it by uh, restarting R and creating a new session. Because um, you might have something like in your environment that's loaded um, that if you create a new session that might give you an error or, or something like that. Uh, suggest you can, so for, I guess for shiny apps or, or any uh, reprex, uh, you usually have some data that you're working with. Um, so it's suggested you can use uh, built-in data sets um, like empty cars or something. Uh, you can create small sample data sets to illustrate your problem. Maybe it's something specific. You need a custom data set. Um, or you can use a subset of your own data and use a dput. So yeah, you want it all in one file and you want the other person to be able to use the same data set that you're working with as well. Uh, the last resort, I'm not sure if I've ever done this personally, but you can provide a complete app and uh, the needed files using um, using like GitHub uh, or zip files uh, so they can access the same stuff you have and and be able to reproduce that. Uh, some notes, make sure to use relative paths and not like my name slash documents slash my personal folder. You, you want to make sure that the other person can easily run it. Uh, and then just make sure your code's easy to read. Uh, there's a tidyverse style guide here. Um, so yeah, just some more uh, hints. I might have gone over some of these already, uh, but trim all all the code that's unnecessary. Um, that might lead to a solution, so that can be helpful of itself. Uh, you can start with your app and remove code piece by piece, or you can even do it in the reverse by starting from scratch and, and building it up to the air. I guess there are advantages of both. Uh, and then Hadley shares an example of, of a reprex that I think this might've been in Stack Overflow or, or something like that. And this wasn't necessarily, I guess, a bad reprex. It, it was, there was stuff that could be improved. Um, like not all the needed packages were loaded. Um, the code wasn't stylized. So I think Hadley um, like fixed that up a little bit as well. 
but like for the most part this was like decent uh so a couple of things hadley did was introduce uh introduce a couple of packages uh stylize the code to make it easier to read um and then as he was going through this example uh he discovered that not all the code was necessary so he he trimmed some of the code down and found out that some of these packages weren't necessary as well um so I think this might have been the final output of of what the reprex could have looked like. Or or I think there might have been one more step. I'm sorry. But yeah, he goes through the example of the reprex what could be like fixed. Um and then that led to discovering the error. So yeah, if if you haven't read it, um, that's definitely helpful to walk through. Um, but yeah, that that was it for the chapter. Um, I personally found that this one was helpful. Um, hopefully those links will be helpful as well. Um, I'm not sure if this was included in the chapter, but okay. Yeah, another helpful resource is uh, Jenny Bryan's 2020 RStudio keynote object of type closure is not subsetable. Um, it definitely goes into, into some debugging and, and error messages. Uh, so I'll just link that as well. Um, yeah, if that's, if, if you have the time, uh, definitely recommend that one. I would add, uh, it's quite an amazing um, video. Please go ahead and check it. The, the link you just dropped now, Trevin. Like, if you can, just go ahead and check it. I checked it and it was quite um, interesting to uh, watch how Jenny Bryan, um, the mystery concept behind Reprex and writing good one. And um, and debugging also, she really um, stated why and how easy it could be if you follow several of the procedures she mentioned. Uh, I think it's... it's it's a good one. Please go ahead and watch it. Yeah, Jen, Jenny is a Jenny is an excellent presenter. So it, it's definitely a definitely a classic. Cool. Uh, it looks like we've hit time. Uh, I guess I'll I'll open the floor to any questions or or comments. So um, any questions, anyone? If you have any questions for Trevin or any questions for the group, just go ahead. I mean, if there's no question, I uh, would like to add that. Um, no question, Lucio, Lydia? No questions, just wanted okay. to say thank you. Thank uh, you, Trevin, okay, uh, thank you, Matthew. Before leaving, just, uh, we just want to confirm something. We want to make a decision. Uh, we're considering we have breaks ahead of us on the 27th, and on we have um, some days ahead of us, and this is the festive season. So we're thinking if we could make 27th and Todd um, three days, then we, we resume again on the 10th of January. Um, is that fine? Or do you guys want us to not have that two week break? <laughs> so, uh, we just want to hear from you guys too. That sounds good. Yeah, because okay. I wanted to do chapter seven, and but I'm still very, very behind. <laughs> so yeah, that would give me time, and I potentially could do chapter six as well. 
yeah with like that amount of time yeah oh that's amazing okay um the thing is lucia actually signed up for chapter six and um, if we have both of you on that day doing a discussion back and forth i think i've seen a group do, do the same thing and it's quite amazing it's more of a discussion so although lucia actually officially signed up for chapter six um if we have okay. a bit more of a discussion it should be beautiful so um I think most R for the S book club are on a two week break. Oh, beautiful. I think uh, Trevin and I even agreed. We just want to see um, if we get a consensus and move ahead with that, that plan. So if we get two weeks break, then we'll resume on the 10th of January. Lucio, is that fine with you? Oh, works for me. Oh, great, great. Oh, great, great, great. So um, I think from my end, I think we've had quite an, um, an interesting discussion today. And um, that means today's officially like our last meeting for the year. We'll be meeting again sometimes in January, but sparing our life to the 10th of January. So we'll meet again and continue with chapter six. In chapter six, um, both Lucia and Lydia will be having the floor and they would um, take us through that um, part of the book and would all contribute. And I believe we'll gain a whole lot in the process. I want to thank you so much for your time, for everyone trying, making our time to be here today and um, sharing your knowledge. This goes a long way. Trevin, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Lucio, Lydia, thank you for showing up again today. Matthew, that's myself. <laughs> thank you too. <laughs> okay, guys. Happy New Year. And um, oh, yeah, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Happy New Year, everyone.